Sure. Oh. You got it, Andy? Yep. All right. Oh, and everybody, please mute. Mute themselves. So I'd like to welcome this morning Emma Cook, who is with us. Uh, Emma works for Embridge. She is the Senior Community Engagement Analyst for the, their U.S. Public Affairs. And uh, part of her territory includes this thing called Line 5 that is occasionally in the news. So it probably keeps Emma relatively busy and, and safely employed, uh, knowing that there's information to manage about that project. I had the pleasure of seeing Emma speak to the Northern Lakes Economic Alliance Board of Directors. Um, that's probably a couple, three months ago now that she spoke there. And I thought, oh, what a great, interesting program about the tunnel project that Enbridge is planning in the Straits of Mackinac. And so with that, I thought I would uh, see if she could come and speak to our group. And she was kind enough to say that she would do that. So she's uh, coming to us from her home in Mackinac City this morning and sharing us information about the Line 5 tunnel. So Emma, please, um, everybody, please welcome Emma Cook. Thank you, Carlin. Um, can you guys just confirm that you can see my screen, the PowerPoint? Yes, we can see it. We can. Okay, awesome. Um, all righty. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak with you guys today. Again, my name is Emma, um, and thank you, Carlin, for the great introduction. But I did just want to call in today to make sure that this group had the latest updates on Line 5 in Michigan and then answer any questions you might have. Um, so just to get started, I like to do an overview of Enbridge on a global scale. So we have over 12,000 employees with operations in 41 states, um, eight provinces, and two territories. And our assets are broken up into four major buckets. So we have our liquids pipelines, our gas transportation, our gas distribution, and then our renewable business. Oh, did I just lose my screen? Yes. Yeah, you lost it. Uh, Okay. Is that PowerPoint back up? Not yet. Coming. There, there we go. Is. Okay, sorry about that. Um, all right, so moving a little bit closer to home, this slide here highlights our assets in Michigan. And again, I will focus on line five today, which I think is the one we are all most familiar with. Um, so Line 5 specifically provides natural gas liquids to the Plains facility in Rapid River where propane is stripped off. And that's that first star that you see there in the Upper Peninsula. And that's where our friends in the propane distribution business will load up their trucks and distribute um, out throughout the UP. So the propane from that facility feeds 65% of the demand in the Upper Peninsula, which is pretty significant. Um, as we move down Line 5, a little bit of a lesser known fact is that Line 5 also receives Michigan produced crude oil at our facility near Lewiston, so that, that second star there. There is oil production in northern Michigan, and that is injected into Line 5 and carried to market. Um, it's injected via a third-party gathering pipeline that originates in the Talcaska area. Um, and then as we move down line five to that last star there, uh, line five also delivers crude to a terminal in Marysville, Michigan. And that terminal has connections to the PDF refinery in Toledo, the BP in Toledo, and then the Detroit Marathon refinery as well. So then from there, the remaining product is delivered to the four refineries across the border in Sarnia, Ontario. And some of that product does move further east into the Eastern Canadian markets, but um, there's a good portion of that refined product that is transported back into Michigan from those Sarnia refineries. So that's all to say that Line 5 really does bring needed energy into Michigan, and it, it truly is just a, a part of a network of pipelines that support the delivery of vital energy for our regional economy, and that's to fuel our cars, our recreational vehicles, and heat our homes. But it's also worth mentioning that we help drive Michigan's economy. So in 2020, Enbridge paid over $68 million in property taxes, which really helps support the services that we depend on in Michigan. Um, and we've also facilitated over a million dollars in community investment initiatives across the state. And just living here in a rural community, I think these dollars will just continue to be so vital uh, to our communities as we are coming out of this pandemic. Um, but with all that said, I want to transition to look at what we're doing to enhance the reliable and safe operation of Line 5. So we are moving full steam ahead with building a tunnel under the straits to house the new um, segment of line five. So the tunnel will have a 21 foot inner diameter with a foot thick concrete, and it will be placed at least 100 feet below the lake bed, virtually eliminating the risk of a release in the straits. 
Um, the tunnel itself is designed to be a utility tunnel, not just a line five tunnel. Um, and actually, as of, of, I would say, about a month ago, a company by the name of Peninsula Fiber Network, um, who is based out of Marquette, publicly announced their interest in co-locating in a tunnel, uh, which will help strengthen broadband reliability throughout northern Michigan and the Upper Peninsula. So that was great news there. Um, and then it's also worth noting that we have submitted all of our major permits for the tunnel project. Um, and we did get great news again about a month ago with Eagle announcing that they've issued all of our environmental permits. So we do still need permits from the Army Corps of Engineers and the Michigan Public Service Commission. Uh, but this is just a huge step in moving towards construction of the tunnel. And we're actually hoping to begin some site preparation um, construction for the tunnel later this year. Um, I like to show this slide here that has a couple different photos that came out of our feasibility study. So that top image there shows a tunnel profile across the straits, again, targeting to be about 100 feet below the channel bottom there. That lower left image is a, a large tunnel boring machine. Um, I think that one's about 36 foot diameter, so a bit bigger than what we would use for our purposes, but um, good for reference as well. And then that lower right image is um, the precast concrete lining in the Eurasia Tunnel and Istanbul, um, very similar utility tunnel um, that we're looking to construct as well. Um, and then that middle picture there is just that concrete lining and what the new 30 inch pipeline will look like inside with some ventilation. So we know that the tunnel is the best solution to secure safe and affordable energy and also protect the Great Lakes. But we also recognize that we have to keep the current pipelines as safe as possible in the meantime, which leads me to my next slide. So we have stood up what is called the Enbridge Straits Maritime Operations Center or the ESMAC. The center is located here in Mackinac City and is monitoring ship traffic in the Straits 24 7, 365. So, as a vessel nears the Straits, we deploy these chase boats and they go and make contact with the vessel um, via radio and confirm with our captain that their anchor is up. And then they also do their own 360 visual inspection with that chase boat just to confirm with our eyes as well. We're also in the process of um, commissioning six high resolution infrared cameras that will help monitor ship traffic as well and will really just be a redundancy um, because we all know in this area you can't always have have boats on the water so even if we can't get boats on the water we'll still have eyes on the water. We have commissioned um, four of those six cameras but the six cameras will be strategically positioned throughout the streets just to ensure that we have uh, visibility to all shipping channels coming into the area. Um, I also just want to note the amazing support we've received throughout Michigan. So we now have 32 counties that have passed resolutions supporting Line 5 and the tunnel project. Uh, I think Michiganders see the tunnel as a, a common sense solution to protect the Great Lakes and ensure safe and reliable energy. And then just before I take any questions, I did want to note um, there's obviously a lot of noise that happened last week. And um, just to, I guess, summarize on November 13th of, of last year, it was Friday the 13th, which seems fitting, but the governor um, did move to revoke our 1953 uh, easement to operate in the streets, and she had given us until May 12th to shut down the line, which was last week. Uh, a shutdown of Line 5 would have serious and broad ram ramifications, and it, it raises substantial federal and international questions just relating to interstate and international commerce. And that's why we had filed in federal court, and that is the judge there had actually ordered mediation, which I think is the best case scenario for us. Um, and we're confident that, that one of these paths will produce a resolution. Uh, our responsibility remains to the people of Michigan and the Great Lakes region, and we'll just continue to deliver um, the Alliance 5 safe, reliable, and affordable energy that helps fuel the region's economy. Um, so with that, I will take any questions the group has. Just remember to unmute, obviously, everybody. Emma, this is Carlin. Um, you, you just said that um, the, the governor's revoking of the easement uh, is now in mediation. Is that what I understood you to just say? Yes, yep, we are currently in mediation, which again, I think is our best case scenario. Um, I, I think sitting down and having actual conversations and getting in a room together will just um, produce a, a really beneficial resolution for everyone. And, and just one follow-up question to that, that, you know, 
you have to have federal permission also to be in those waters. Uh, does the governor actually have the authority to revoke an easement um, um, when the federal, uh, I think you kind of implied this, that the federal government was involved also. Yeah, um, so pipelines are federally regulated by FIMSA. So that is our federal regulator. So the state's attempt to step in as role of, of regulator was um, improper and, and our argument was actually unlawful. Um, so yes, we, we have a federal regulator who oversees all of our, our pipelines. I uh, have noticed that your pipeline, they point out, is uh, almost 70 years old. Uh, and people may see that number and think, well, gee, something that old can't be any good anymore. I'm almost 70 years old, so I don't agree with that. And uh, I noticed that the Mackinac Bridge is almost 70 years old as well. I, I don't hear anybody advocating that the Mackinac Bridge isn't safe anymore. It needs to be shut down. Uh, what about the age of the, the line? Is that uh, something people should be concerned about? Um, I, I mean, I think kind of to what you were saying, uh, it, it's not like the line was installed and then just left there. I mean, we are constantly doing maintenance on it and it's just like with a car, you get a car and you um, do proper upkeep and maintenance, it'll, it'll last you a long time. So we just continue to modernize and enhance our system. So line five is operating safely and reliably but also looking forward to the future, which is why we're, we're looking to build the tunnel projects because um, we want something that will, will last generations and protect the Great Lakes for generations. Do the uh, materials that flow through the pipeline have any type of caustic effect on the lining? Um, is it eroding from the inside, so to speak, or from the outside, from the, uh, the waters of the, of the Great Lakes? Um, that's a that's a really good question. So we do have a, a pretty robust um, inspection program where we we go down with divers and inspect the pipeline every um, every summer. But it's actually interesting at those water depths you need um, oxygen to to cause corrosion like that, and just at those depths you don't you don't have that there. Um, so from a, an outside perspective, no. And then on the inside, we actually do inject. Um, a, a liquid called a drag reducing agent, which flows along with the pipeline that kind of lubricates the inside of, of the pipeline. So there is no um, corrosion from the materials either. If something were to happen with the pipeline, how fast can it get shut down? Um, so it takes the valves here about three minutes to fully close. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Emma, could you clarify this for me? Because I didn't quite understand. So basically the building of that structure would be 100 feet underground. But is there any concern for the actual construction and building part of it? Because I mean, you have to have machinery and stuff. Is there any concern with that in the Great Lakes? Um, no. So we we've done and are currently still doing some seismic studies um, from that perspective. but. We, uh, we've consulted with some of the, the largest uh, tunneling experts in the, in the world and they definitely say it is feasible. And um, about two summers ago now, if you were to drive over the bridge, I'm sure you saw a large um, vessel kind of pos positioned out there over a pipeline. So they were doing um, geotech work. So we did take um, a full geotech survey of the straits there just to know exactly what we would be boring through because that plays obviously a huge role um, in design of the tunnel as well. But we have a full picture of what that geology is and, and know that that is something that's definitely feasible to, to bore through and fill the tunnel. Uh, Emma, if, if there is a leak, um, what is uh, Enbridge's responsibility then? Who, who, who pays the cost for the cleanup? Um, so we would bear the cost of that cleanup and we um, have actually already invested over $7 million in some state-of-the-art spill response equipment that we have stationed here, which we've invested seven, over $7 million in the hopes that we would never ever have to see those touch the water, um, obviously, but you wanna be over-prepared always. Um, but we would bear the cost and we, we train our, our employees and our staff up on, on response equipment as well. So we're fully committed um, in that regard. Mm -hmm. 
And Emma, how long will this tunnel project actually take to, to complete? So when you can shut the pipeline down? Um, so to, to build the tunnel, uh, to bore across the streets coming out of our, our geotech and figuring out what that geology was, um, it, we're estimating it would take about two years to bore across the streets. So about 40 feet a day would be on average that that tunnel boring machine would, would move. So from the time that we break ground until the time that the new pipeline is installed and in service, it would be two to two and a half years. And so that, um, but the biggest, I guess, unknown I'll say right now is permitting. Um, so just waiting until we have all permits in hand before we. So once the tunnel is bored, how long does it take to actually transition the pipeline from in the water to in the tunnel? Uh, we're guessing about six months until we can have, once the tunnel is bored and um, we can get that new pipeline in there, it's about six months. So that's why I say like two to two and a half years. So two years to bore across, six months to get that new pipeline in service. Oh, super. Thank you. The other question I had was um, you had stated that um, the tunnel was the best solution to replacing the current pipeline. What other options did you guys look at instead of the tunnel? Um, so when we first started looking at replacing that streets crossing, we had kind of three different options that we were looking at. One being the tunnel. Um, the other one was a horizontal directional drill. So where you would actually kind of drill and, and string that pipe through under the lake bed. Um, but I think the world record for longest uh, horizontal directional drill is two, two and a half miles. So it just didn't seem feasible to, to do that across the streets being that, that long distance there. And then the last um, option we looked at was actually burying the pipe with rock um, on the bottom of the lake bed, but it, you still kind of run the risk of having an anchor drag over over the buried pipeline if it's just buried with rock. So um, to, to be as safe as possible, the tunnel is the best solution. Emma, is it safe to say that this was the most expensive option that you're choosing? Uh, yeah, the tunnel was absolutely um, the, the most expensive option. We're estimating about $500 million right now. And then one other question, what was the reason given for the revoking of the easement to begin with? Um, I, there was a, a letter that was sent, but there really was no basis for, for revoking the easement. And that's kind of what our argument is in federal court. Um, you can't, can't revoke the easement on, on no grounds and um, also being federally regulated, that, that really is the federal government's jurisdiction. Okay, thank you, Emma. That was very informative. Um, I'm sure if any follow up questions come, we can we can find you. <laughs> I'm sure. That's yeah, gonna I'll put my contact information in the chat. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Emma. And um, sorry. Okay, we will. Uh, be back on Zoom next week. And with that, the thought of the day, um, actually quote of the day, comes from Judy Garland. Be a first-rate version of yourself instead of a second-rate version of somebody else. So, all right, board members,